So, we transitioned. He is now a full-time traveling rabbi type of preacher. He's already got some disciples. And the next thing John uh, Matthew is going to tell us is what his ministry was like. The first thing about his ministry that he wants to show us is his ministry in word. What he taught. What did Jesus say when he preached at that time in Galilee? And you'll notice that it takes up the next three chapters. The teaching in Matthew is uh, gathered in a special way. We think it was perhaps because Matthew in his later years was a teacher himself. And instead of scattering the words of Jesus right across the biography that he was writing, he grouped it in his book into something called discourses. Um, That's like uh, an essay or a sermon on one major topic. Matthew groups it into five discourses. You'll notice how they are grouped. First one is three chapters of Sermon on the Mount. Second one is instruction to his 12 disciples as he sent them out in chapter 10. Chapter 13 is another grouping of parables. Uh, In chapter 18, uh, he talks about what it'll be like when the church, not the tribes of Israel, but churches are formed. And then teaching on the end times is the last discourse. Obviously, today, we're going to run into the very first grouping of chapters. There's about 10 of them there. That's roughly a third of the book of Matthew is dedicated to the teaching of Jesus. So we would understand and follow what he taught. Today, we are going to hit on chapter 5. And Brother Hank uh, read for us from chapter 5. As I was studying it, reading it, reading commentators on it, thinking about it, I found that the Sermon on the Mount was truly an amazing sermon. Uh, If you can read that sermon and not be jarred, not be challenged to the very core of your Christian thinking, uh, I, I would be surprised. It is the most convicting sermon that I have read And uh, as I was looking at it over the last two weeks, I thought, I'll never do it uh, five cents of justice. I have never preached a sermon that even comes close. However, in uh, in, uh, the purpose of trying to get through Matthew in a timely fashion, I am going to do the unthinkable. I'm going to cut it up. I'm going to cover it all today. I figure 7 o'clock, what do you think? Three chapters. I'm just going to do his first points and his conclusion. I'm going to skip everything else. That's not fair. But to move through it, we're going to do point one and his wrap-up to get a flavor of the kind of preaching and teaching that the people of Galilee heard from the lips of the Savior as he taught in his ministry. Here we go. It says this, Now when Jesus saw the crowds that were following him, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Now it wouldn't be a mountain like we have out here. Around Galilee, they're just big hills. So a crowd could walk up. Sitting down was the way teachers taught in those days, and the people stood. I actually think that's way better So that if that was the way it would be today, you would be standing and I would be sitting in your soft chair. I think that's the way it should be. Uh, Things have changed and I don't quite understand. Uh, However, uh, now why would Matthew tell us that Jesus went up on a mountain and, and began to teach? Like, so what? It's what he said, not where he was. So Matthew must have a purpose in telling us he went up on a mountainside. If you'll recall, mountains were significant in the Israel, in the history of Israel. There was another mountain that was highly significant in the nation's history. That was Mount Sinai in the desert, Horeb. And the person who went up, of course, was Moses. Uh, he is sometimes styled in the Bible as Israel's king, though he never really put on a crown. He went up on that mountain and received the law 
upon which the beginning of that society, that kingdom, the nation of Israel was founded. You don't just start a country. You have to have laws and organization according to how the kingdom will operate. And Moses brought them down from the mountain. So what we think is the reason for this comment is that Matthew is styling Jesus like a second Moses. And so he has him going up on the mountain, and he is going to preach, as was said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is now a new Israel, a new kingdom. There is a new king, a new lawgiver, It's going to be established on a higher base because it's a more wonderful kingdom. He is the second Moses beginning the law of a new kingdom. Now, in case you think that I'm cheating, I am going to read uh, an ancient prophecy that one of the last words that Moses gave to his nation as he was preparing within days to die, this is what he said. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. I will raise up for them, this is God speaking, a prophet like Moses from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. So, again, Matthew is reminding us that a wonderful prophet would come, a second Moses, more powerful than Moses himself. God would put his words into his mouth, and who would not listen to them would have to answer to God himself. Now, this I see as the key verse in Christ's Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. This is kind of a summary verse to what I think the Sermon in the Mount was all about. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. Crowds are listening in. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter my kingdom new coming kingdom. Well, let's think about that. The Pharisees were the teachers of the law. There was also a second group to just call themselves the professors that taught the Mosaic law. And yet Jesus was saying that his words would be very different because those teachers had bought into culture. They weren't teaching anything unique It was not coming from God. It sounded like everyone else. What the world was doing, they had accepted. They weren't going to enter the kingdom. This was going to be radically different. This was a law that would not be necessarily acceptable to the culture of that day. It would be shocking. It might be resisted. And it may cost you if you were to live by it. But unless you did, the new kingdom that Jesus was bringing in would not have you as one of its citizens. So here we go. The beginning of the sermon will be Jesus' new standard of citizenship in his new light kingdom of Israel. Twelve verses is his point one. Brother Hank read them. That point one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so on, down through eight uh, particular characteristics that you would be blessed for. Now, blessed is normally understood as having favor with God. But every time I read commentators on the Sermon on the Mount, they insist that the word has another meaning. And the meaning, they say, is happy are you, is a literal translation of that Greek word, blessed. So in other words, to do this will fill you with happiness. 
Maybe we'll combine the two. We'll say, uh, if you have the favor of God, then you will have a response from within you that will be a welling up joy that will fill you with uh, just the feeling of fulfillment and knowing you're walking in the steps of God. That continues through seven, through seven characteristics till we get to verse 11. Uh, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. So there it is again. That's the same thing as blessed, except this time the word rejoice, I'm told, is, is literally to mean leap with happiness. So it would look something like this. So it's on a scale. Blessed are you, happy are you, to the point of leaping with joy because of the difference this makes if you live according to the new laws of the kingdom that Jesus was bringing in. Now that's powerful. That's very powerful. He's telling us that if we live this way, there is a brand new fulfillment, an inner inspiration that comes to the point of leaping with happiness. We say, this isn't like everybody says. This is the way to live if you want to be blessed beyond belief. And no matter what our conditions, whether we're persecuted, whether we're poor, uh, whether we are mourning, there is an inner inspiration that makes a massive difference in our life. So we need to examine them. What are the characteristics of blessedness? Well, we're going to go fast. We don't have time today to look at them uniquely and individually. So I've got eight of them listed here, the eight that Jesus gave. You'll be blessed if you're poor, if you mourn, if you're meek, if you're hungry and thirsty, if you're merciful, if you're pure in heart, peacemakers, and persecuted for Jesus' sake. We probably should take a moment to see their meanings, and here is what it comes to. Poor is poor in spirit. Uh, it's to admit that I have spiritual need. If I'm going to experience this joy, this blessedness, I'm not there yet. I'm a long ways from the kind of person I have great need in my life. If you were to know the way I live in my house, you would say, oh, he's got some problems. Mourn. Mourn means deep regret for my sin. Regret for why I am so spiritually poor. Meek is uh, a person that will not grab to get ahead in life, but will wait for God to naturally bring it about. If God doesn't, they're willing to accept a lesser place. Hungry and thirsty are a metaphor for spiritual longing. Merciful is uh, to be intentionally kind to people who are nasty to you. They treat you poorly, but you intentionally and purposefully respond in kindness. Pure. Pure in heart. Normally we think it's sexual purity, but the word here means undivided. Uh, a heart that is totally focused on one thing. In this case, it would be on serving God with no ulterior motives. So, if people are nasty to us and take things away that are ours, we are willing, if that's what it takes to serve God, to keep on living with less because I'm doing it for the sake of Christ. We will not grasp to get what we think has been taken unlawfully from us. A peacemaker uh, will seek peace and pursue it with people who are unkind, who want no peace. They're your persecutors. Persecuted means hostile treatment when actually you have been kind to them. Wow. That is not a happy, slappy sermon. Uh, this is surprising. So let's take a moment to think about it. Somebody has said that if we could group these characteristics, uh, the poor, mourning, hungry, and thirsty, could actually be grouped under the heading of grief. Uh, being meek, not grasping, and, and serving Christ, and not 
reaching for the things around would be actually a weakness in today's society. Merciful to people who are nasty to you or, or trying to make peace with folks who have abused you takes effort and sacrifice. And if you're persecuted, you will be excluded from the in people, from the crowd that is having a wonderful fellowship, we suppose, together. So here it is. That's a summary of these blessed characteristics. And Jesus says they are the basis of our life's rule in his new, wonderful, everlasting, joyful, blessed happy kingdom wow wow that's that is difficult to imagine uh if we would compare well yeah uh, that's the way we're supposed to respond to that but something has to happen for us to do this after we read those that is accepted uh that is that is the way uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is responded to by today's world. Uh, that is my model of a fairly well-known British psychiatrist. Here is his comment. He's not a believer. Here is his comment on these supposedly good conditions for living in Christ's kingdom. The spirit that so permeates Christianity, in my opinion, is masochism. That's self-harm. The strongest expression of masochism is to be found in Christ's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount because he blesses the poor, the meek, the persecuted, says to do good to them that hate you and forgive them their trespasses. All this breeds masochism. You actually think this is going to help you? You're going to leap for joy in grief because you're excluded and persecuted for the sake of Christ makes absolutely no sense to persons outside the kingdom. Because are the old kingdom of the scribes and Pharisees, well, let's put it this way, our present society sees the important things, if we would match them, instead of grief, we want success in today's society. Instead of weakness, we want power. Sacrifice, we'd rather have comfort. Exclusion, we want recognition. So there is a sharp dichotomy between the way our world today and the world of Jesus was very much the same, and the rules of the new kingdom just seem absolute opposites. However, however, they do, in, in a sense, make sense. Uh, poor, mourn, meek, hungry, merciful, pure, peacemaker... Jesus said, if you keep to those, I guarantee you that you will be blessed. Okay, so I should have mentioned that despite sounding really bad, those who are poor, uh, if they admit their need before God, will, if they respond, inherit the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn, because of their sin, will be comforted by God. Uh, those who give up their rights on in this society, Jesus said, God guarantees that they will inherit the world to come. The spiritual hungry, when they turn to God, will be filled with the Spirit of God and what he can offer. If we are merciful to our enemies, God himself will show us mercy by bringing us into his kingdom. If we serve God alone with an undivided heart, we will eventually see him, though we serve him now by faith. The peacemakers will inherit the kingdom of God, and for the persecuted, their reward will be great. But let's still just kind of wrap it up. The old ones, the recognition, the comfort, the power, the success, are natural. Uh, it, nobody, nobody runs a seminar saying how to be full of grief, how to be persecuted and excluded. That will not, will not be able to be franchised. You, you won't have a good business if you try that. But it has the power of now, grasping, recognition, promotion. They do work today. The people that go for that get it. 
The new kingdom of Christ, however, is spiritual and therefore unseen. It is unnatural. It is by faith. But Jesus guarantees that the power of the world to come will be behind it. I'm going to make just one comment on that. Notice what we read. Jesus went throughout Galilee, healing every disease and sickness among the people. All who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, demon possession, having seizures, the paralyzed, were healed. This amazing power was displayed by Jesus in this provocative sermon. Just before that, they had noticed miracle after miracle happening to let them know that the kingdom of heaven wasn't just future. The power of the kingdom had already begun. They could see that there was true. There was a new kingdom invading the old one. The power overcame all disease, all opposition. There was no pain, no sickness, not even demon possession could stand against it. That kingdom was already on its way. So it reminds me of something. Remember the story of uh, Belshazzar? He had the Persians all around the city of Babylon. They'd been there for weeks and months. The walls were too high. Babylon was impregnable. And just to let everyone know, he ran a banquet. Uh, Besieged by the Persians, but he was so secure that a thousand of his nobles and his wives were invited to a great banquet. While he banqueted in his security of his kingdom, the words were written on the wall. You have been weighed in the balances. You've been found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to another. And that night, the Bible says, that very night that the banquet was given, uh, turns out that apparently someone was a traitor in Babylon. They opened the river gates The army uh, lowered the level of the river by building a dam further up. We're able to wade across the Euphrates, walk into the city of Babylon unhindered without bringing down the walls. And that very night, the Persians slew Belshazzar in his bed without firing a shot, as the words might be. And Belshazzar's kingdom was over, and the Persians began to reign. At the height of his power, When he felt super secure with the enemy, unable to touch him outside, his days were already numbered. The invaders were there on his doorstep, and his kingdom was over in a flash, and a new one began. I think that's what this is trying to say. There's a new kingdom coming. It's a kingdom of blessing. It's an eternal kingdom that will never be overturned. There's a price to pay, but it's already on its way. It will soon end, and the new kingdom will come with its reward. I've got to conclude. I'm going to read briefly from Jesus' conclusion. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come and say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand, the wind came down, the streams rose, The winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash, 
And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. They were amazed. They were thunderstruck. They were, they were astonished. And they knew this was not like the teaching they had gotten from their teachers of the law. Why was that? Te Jesus taught as one with authority. It didn't sound like what they were hearing in their society. It was so different that it had to be authentic. It had the ring of truth in it, though it was very, very different. And this was his conclusion. He had three parts here. I don't have time to take care of it, but you know the parables. We read them. There was a broad gate, broad way that many take to destruction, and a narrow way, and few there be find it. He talked about teachers that say you don't have to change your lifestyle. You can live the way everyone else does it, and you will still get into the kingdom of God. He said, don't believe them. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Reject their teaching. And the final one was the parable of two houses, one on a solid rock and one on sinking sand. His thoughts, I think, were three. A storm is coming. All right, if we're going to talk about the house one, he was saying, if you hear these words of mine and don't put them into practice, remember there's a storm coming. It will beat against your life. It will shake it. It will examine it. It will penetrate it right to the core of its foundation. And if you haven't lived according to my teaching, then your house, your life will disintegrate on the day of judgment. Um, we just had hurricanes down in the south. We assume it's because their president isn't a nice guy, and, and Justin is, and we don't have those storms. But I, I was reading about people down south, Louisiana, and they expect them, and they build small shelters uh, out in their yards or under the ground. They put kind of a big, uh, uh, a big uh, culvert, and uh, it's just big enough to go into when the tornadoes or the hurricanes come through. So what if, well, what if your children were in bed and sleeping and you're watching television before you go to bed and they say a hurricane is coming? And you say, okay, well, we don't want to wake up our children. Uh, being kind to them, we want them to keep on sleeping. Let's you and me just go down in the shelter and save our lives and let the children keep sleeping. Let's not disturb them from their present activity. That would not be love. The storm is as bad as it sounds, though it's a tornado or a hurricane coming. It's the truth. And there is a shelter. If we turn our lives over to Jesus, we will be able to weather the storm. But we need to pass out the bad weather report. It is true. It is coming. The judgment seat of Christ will examine and penetrate our lives and unless we've chosen these radically different values to live by through the power of Jesus well you can look at a sheep uh, or at least a wolf with sheep's clothing on and he might look just the same there could be two people both saying they are Christians and you cannot see what their lives are founded on until that day of judgment, when that storm comes, it will shatter all pretense and open up the inner core upon which life is built. And then we will find that only those who've built their life on the teaching and the sacrifice of Jesus will be the ones who stand the test. If you take a look at your life now and keep on living it the way it is, where will we end up on that day? Let's bow in prayer. Father, you sent your son to preach the new kingdom with radically different values, make no sense to us in our world today. And yet you guarantee that this kingdom's days are numbered. We're already beginning to see the new kingdom arise 
And if by faith we can trust in you, you promise us the blessing, jumping with joy in a wonderful kingdom in the sight of God himself. Lord, it's hard to live according to different values. It is unnatural to follow your ways and yet open our hearts to the truth of where our lives will end. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.